The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. This is an opinion-based program. This is Other Verena 24 tonight. It's all about a numbers game. The presidential election is slowly moving ahead with two candidates officially announced and several more expected to get in the ring. What does this mean to the bottom line? With a crowded field vying for the support from the same pool of voters, will we see an unprecedented affair where the winner will be selected after counting the second preferential vote? If that is the case, will it really portray the will of the people? As key demographies are now in discussion with the two main parties to provide their support based on demands, will a credible third candidate bust it all up? For insight and analysis on the numbers game in the upcoming presidential election, tonight my guests are Rohan Hetiarachi, the Executive Director for People's Action for a Free and Fair Election of PAFRO, and Gehan Gunathilaka, Research Director at Verite Research. Welcome to Monday. It's time to get real. A happy Monday evening to you. Tonight we continue to focus on the upcoming presidential election and ask the question, with a very crowded field, can anyone really pass the required threshold of 50% and one vote to secure the presidency? If not, then what? Well, in my opening statement this evening, in a couple of months, our country once again will undergo a test that would eventually select a leader that will take this nation to the future. We all seem to be high on as to who will fight whom and what names will battle it out. Is it going to be a Rajapaksa Premadasa battle? Or perhaps Rajapaksa Vikramasinghe battle? Or even possibly a Rajapaksa Jayasurya battle? Then there's the third candidate, Mr. Anru Kumar Sanaga, who seems to be slowly rising to the ranks of being not an option, but more also a ward that could be cast because people hate the mainstream candidates. And there's a talk of possibly another candidate backed by the singular Buddhist monks. And recently talks of a Muslim candidate to represent that community. In the last presidential election, there were 19 candidates. However, despite a massive pool, there was only two credible persons vying for the top job. Former President Mahindra Rajpaksa and current President Maitrapala Sirisena. However, the winning margin was a vaguely thin 449,072 votes. That was the amount that pushed current President Sirisena over the 50% threshold. Now this time around, if there's a credible third candidate, possibly JVP's Andhra Kumar Desanayake, it seems that he might be able to track more than half a million votes in his back, begging the question, can any candidate viably get 50% plus one vote? <laughs> Well, first you'll have to <laughs> decide on the second candidate. As of now, right, the question cannot be answered because they, when it comes to the second, the two major parties, in fact, uh, Sri Lanka, Potujana, Peramuna and the UNP. We have nominated and we have, uh, uh, in fact, uh, have worked towards, uh, you know, the elections. Um, but as far as uh, the UNP is concerned, still they are struggling. Of course, they are covering up saying that uh, you have enough time and uh, you know you should uh, wait till the last minute but the whole public knows and the country knows that's not the case well you cannot stop uh, people contesting uh, if you see if you remember right i mean the last elections we had people getting less than one percent of the vote so the third candidate in the form of jvb i suppose that they have a vote bank of about half a million uh, five hundred thousand votes all the time. Um, there can be an improvement in that or there can be a, a, a decrease in that. We, we cannot predict it right now. But, uh, well, uh, a third candidate will definitely have an impact on the main uh, results. If you analyze, if you analyze uh, uh, the presidential elections uh, uh, since 1982, right, there is no, no place for third force in our country. The people 
uh, at the last moment, uh, they, they are divided into two camps, two camps, progressive camp and the reactionary camp. So therefore, I think this time, uh, people need a change. Uh, change means not mere change, but change with some concepts and matching to international standards. So that is why the, 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 there may be uh, 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 two, two camps, and I don't think third force have no place in the country. So then people will rally around a candidate who can address the present issues effectively and efficiently. Next election, I think uh, a new face, uh, a young new face uh, will lead the uh, race to the presidential election. I believe that the UMP candidate, UMP-led alliance candidate, will be the next president of Sri Lanka. Right, let's get more perspective on the subject that we are discussing tonight uh, and I'm joined tonight uh, by two individuals who are experts on election by numbers and strategies. Tonight I'm joined by Mr. Rohan Ahetiarachi who is the director for uh, People's Action for a Free and Fair Election. Uh, you might also know it as PAFRO and also Gehan Gunathilaka who is the director for research at Verite Research here in Colombo. Now today's discussion is not about headbutting from two sides to a question but more also of an intellectual discussion that would give you some credible facts of what we are up against as we head for the presidential election very soon. Well, um, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining uh, me tonight. Uh, seems to be, uh, it's not clear cut as we uh, go ahead for the presidential election. If I start with you, uh, Rohana, um, what kind of a president? Uh, what kind of an election can we expect this time around? It seems like there is a provincial council election uh, on the cards, a presidential election. Uh, what seems to be? Uh yeah, well, uh, as you mentioned, there are two elections uh, we are discussing at the moment, but it's very clear the presidential elections has to take place before 9th of December. So, the, uh, according to the constitutions. It has to be uh, uh, after 9th of November and before 9th of December. Th that is very clear cut. So uh, executive or uh, legislatures, they can't control that. It will take place within this period. Uh, the date will be decided by the election commission. But the provincial council, actually it's a drama. Mm -hmm. it, it has started uh, in 20th amendment in uh, two years back, or a little, I mean three years back actually. And as Paffel, we went to the Supreme Court and they stopped that. Then they came with the, the women's quota mm -hmm. and they changed the, the entire electoral system. So, I mean, when you look at the whole picture, it is purposely they were trying to postpone the elections. So that is the background. Now, at the moment, uh, the president of the country is trying to uh, have a provincial elections before uh, the presidential elections. But we do not know the, what is the judgment came from the court. But I think the, as president, he need to publicize whatever, the, uh, whatever he got from the court. But unfortunately, so far, we have not see, uh, hear anything. Uh, so therefore, we do not know what is the real picture behind the provincial elections. I mean, according to my uh, po uh, political reading, uh, there is no space for provincial elections before the presidential elections. because. The court can't give any order against parliament, according to my knowledge. I mean, Gehan can explain because he's a lawyer. Uh, because this delimitation report uh, uh, rejects the entire parliament, including the minister who has present to the parliament. So mm -hmm. there's no way to take up the, uh, the previous uh, uh, delimitation report. Then they have to review. The review committee also failed to complete it. Uh, but unfortunately, before they complete, what two days before, the complete of the delimitation review, the president dissolved the parliament. This is unfortunate situation of the country. But when you look at the whole picture, it is really drama. Mm -hmm. So we do not know uh, whether provincial elections will take place uh, before a presidential election or after presidential election. But according to our political reading, presidential elections will take place first. And after that, uh, most probably, uh, parliamentary elections also can take place because it can dissolve after February, whoever coming as a president of the country. So uh, whoever will take the advantage 
and having all other elections within a short period mm -hmm. if they get the clear cut majority in the presidential elections indeed um, gehan if i uh, turn to you uh, what, what what is your take on this you think uh, the president can squeeze in uh, a provincial council election prior to the presidential it'll be very difficult to do that uh, because this is a domain that parliament has a jurisdiction over so we have three organs of government we have parliament we have the judiciary and then we have the executive uh, and this i think is quite clearly within the domain of parliament because parliament has taken a decision uh, on delimitation and needing to finalize that prior to going ahead with the provincial council election uh, now the court can have an opinion on this because this is also a matter for constitutional interpretation uh, and uh, it could be that the court disagrees but we don't know that yet because this unlike a usual judgment which is a public document this is a reference that the president made uh, under certain powers that are vested in him under the constitution to the supreme court and the supreme court is only really responsible in terms of conveying its opinion to the president now if the president doesn't publish uh, that uh, that opinion we can uh, take it for granted that the opinion is not in uh, yeah. line with uh, what he wanted mm -hmm. uh, so we can assume that the supreme court has uh, uh, declared in some way that uh, the presidential election must precede uh, whatever other election he has in mind uh, but let's see i mean it's still early days if uh, the supreme court has surprised us uh, we are here yet to hear about it um, if we come to the presidential election and uh, we are seeing now there are two candidates uh, who have been confirmed by their respective parties we are looking at a third candidate uh, and possibly a fourth candidate uh, Rohana if I um, get your opinion on this how important is this election the presidential election and how crucial uh, I mean what kind of a strategy should any of those uh, party candidates should obtain in order to make sure that they um, pass the threshold of 50 percent plus one vote in order to get the presidency because it seems it's not clear as of now, now the law is very clear the whoever uh, the candidate among the, I mean, the last time I can remember there was about uh, 19 candidates. So now you are referring two candidates. At the moment, it's publicly, actually not two, there are a few others also from yes. uh, the civil mm. society groups. Uh, but uh, the, no matter how many candidates contest the elections, the matter is uh, the winning candidate should get 50 plus one. That is a very clear. So in case uh, if nobody get 50 plus one, uh, the, again, the Constitution and the elections law clearly stated that uh, the election commissions need to uh, uh, consider the second and third preference. But unfortunately, in this country from 1982 up to now, now this is the eighth elections, uh, eighth presidential election which we are supposed to have, we don't exercise this. But uh, considering the political uh, situation in the country and uh, looking at the, the candidate which uh, are, are coming into the scene, most probably in the coming elections, uh, we, we may have to count the second and third preference. But th there are, that is also depend on the two assumptions. The number one is uh, the, the, uh, the, the main candidate, whether they have a close fight each other, whether they are very close, uh, I mean, whether they, both candidates can get a, the, uh, the bigger number of votes. If it is a close fight, and at the same time, if there is a, a third, fourth candidate can obtain around more than 500,000, uh, 600,000 votes, then definitely we may have to go for a second and third mm. preference. So that is the, the, the legal requirement, and that is the practical uh, scenario which we can uh, face uh, during the counting period. Uh, Gehan, what do you think this election is going to be one that we have not charted before this is going to be uncharted waters for most um, entities even the election commissioner might not be sure exactly how will it play out uh, what do you think you think that uh, apparently we will see a clear majority from the first take 
No, I think uh, Rohan is right. This is going to be an unusual election. Uh, and I think there is something going on within the electorate, within the, the, the mindset of uh, voters that we have to study carefully. Uh, I mean, uh, my organization, Verite, uh, published a, 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 a weekly analysis looking at the media. Mm -hmm. And our last analysis actually uh, was very interesting because it looked at uh, Anurag Kumar Gadisarnayaka's candidacy. Uh, and that, for me, is uh, demonstrating or at least indicating mm -hmm. something that uh, is unusual. That there seems to be two types of discontent uh, that is emerging within uh, the voters' mindset. Uh, one is a discontent, of course, with the current uh, government, uh, frustration over the lack of progress, a sort of incumbency-based discontent. But there's another discontent which I think might we might be seeing for the first time in this form, and that's a discontent in terms of mainstream politics. Mm. Uh, this idea of a third candidate has never been this current uh, in any previous election. Which means the idea of a third candidate is no longer just another candidate mm. that is that may get a few hundred thousand votes. This is a very serious uh, campaign and a serious uh, sort of ethos that has built around this uh, discontent around um, uh, the mainstream po politicians. Now, if a candidate was to come at the intersection of these two discontents, mm. if a candidate was to disassoci disassociate himself from the incumbent government, but also effectively disassociate himself from mainstream political parties, that candidate may be able to get a protest vote. And that protest vote may be more than 500,000 votes. Uh, that immediately casts a bit of a question mark as to whether any mainstream candidate can secure 50% of the, uh, the, uh, the votes. Uh, I think we are looking at a situation where for the first time, no candidate will secure 50% of the, the votes. If you're talking about protest votes, it means that they are not happy with both the candidates that have been put forward by the main two parties. They, they want a third party candidate, but it does not clearly say that we like the third party candidate. It's just we are not happy with the first two. But, but as a voter, should they be thinking, like, doing that, is that going to help the country? That's a good question. Um, and I think there's going to be a, a tension amongst a lot of these voters between their protest, which may be ultimately going to a candidate that's not viable, and their pragmatism. Uh, so it's likely that a lot of these voters will want to give a protest vote, but also give a pragmatic vote. And this will depend on the second preference, whether there's an effective campaign that raises awareness of, of this option, where people can vote for their preferred candidate in terms of their protest, but then also give a pragmatic vote to the candidate they wish to see in power, because they know that their preferred candidate is not viable. Uh, Rohan, if uh, I may ask you, I I in a scenario where neither candidate gets the majority, 50% plus one, we have to go to the second and the third of the third candidate, the, the, the preferential votes. Uh, if I say that really does not showcase the true mandate of the people, because it, 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 the second and the third vote of the third candidate is merely something that they exercise saying, okay, we are okay with this person, but not clearly a mandate. So why is there a system like that? Why can't we exactly just say the majority person who has the most number of votes wins? Yeah, that is a good question. But whether it is right or wrong, that is the law in the country. So at the moment, we have to respect the law. I mean, if we are not happy with that, of course, the, the legislatures, they need to change it. So at the moment, this is the law for the country and this is the law for the upcoming elections. The, your question is very valid because uh, whether we are giving the same value, first preference and the second preference, and also the third preference, when it's count to the uh, the second third preference, it take as a first preference when they uh, when they count uh, at yeah. the counting. So what will happen is, uh, in case the, this this will be an issue, in case if the second losing candidate get most second, third preference, and if we lead the first candidate and become a president, then there will be an issue, and there, there will be a public issue. But the legally, 
Is that right. is that is correct. Legally, that is correct. But in a, in a, in that scenario, how the the political party and you know the leader of the parties how they are taking it to the public, so that will be an issue. Uh, and uh, when they start the second third counting, their purse counting purse uh, vote, not purse preferential vote will not count. Then the election official will take their second preference as a purse. Uh, preference so that is the the system uh, which we have so uh, legally it will not an uh, issue but in practically as you mentioned uh, in publicly it can uh, make a big issue uh, by the politicians whoever losing so they can use this and they can make uh, public Say that they don't have a clear mandate exactly and also when when they uh, whoever coming to the power as the head of the state they need to get the uh, the vote across the country that also make a, a difference if some uh, candidate get uh, uh, majority in some area mm -hmm. and he may not get uh, uh, some portion of the votes uh, the rest of the country then that also can uh, uh, make a issue but uh, the legally that is not a matter mm -hmm. wherever he got the votes if he get 50 plus 1 or finally get the majority then he or she will become a president of the country. But the, you know the politician in this country, how they play with the politics. So they can make a issue. Indeed. Um, Gehan, do you think, in your opinion, that this election would be decided in the courts? Could any, any uh, a candidate who is not happy with the outcome, because it, it went to the two, uh, second and the third uh, preferential votes and, and the result came not exactly what they hoped for. You think they can go to courts and actually this entire election be decided there? Well, I, I don't think there is a valid case uh, for a candidate to go to the courts merely because he lost on the second or third preferential preference vote, because that's very clearly in the law and uh, you would have to challenge the application of that law. Mm. Uh, you could, of course, see situations where a candidate is unhappy about the outcome of an election, uh, making an allegation that it wasn't free and fair. Yeah. Uh, that sort of situation you may, may, may arise, may, you may uh, encounter, but I, do, I don't think there's a valid case. I mean, I can't predict as to whether there will mm -hmm. be cases or not, but I, I doubt there's a valid case challenging the application of the second and th uh, third preference votes. Because the, the law is extremely clear, the Presidential Elections Act has a specific provision on this. And, it, and even though we have never encountered it uh, in, in the various elections we've had in the past, uh, this is in fact in the law. Uh, and it's for the first time that we are actually going to have to confront this provision. Uh, and I'm sure a candidate that uh, doesn't uh, get a clear majority in the, or clear 50% on the first round, uh, but then gets defeated on the second round on a second and third uh, preference vote count, will be unhappy. But I don't think uh, a, a judicial uh, intervention there is going to solve that candidate's problem. Uh, it'll have to be a different type of allegation. Uh, Rohana, um, if you take a look at uh, the, the groups uh, who is coming into these, uh, the presidential election and trying to actually um, request the public uh, to vote for them, we've now seen there are three parties. We are looking at strong, credible fourth party as well. This, if it is a fourth party uh, who would actually uh, rise from the southern part of the country, which is like could be the Sinhalese Buddhist majority, um, what do you think? How, how do you think this entire election would play out? Do you think it's it's actually a waste of time because nobody is going to get a clear majority, or is it is it something that uh, we can actually get through? No, we can't say that because the democracy and. Uh, electing our representative that is our right it will take it will it will be expensive mm. so election commission uh, uh, itself uh, the expenses is quite high so i mean in in a democracy in selecting our representative we have to pay something so this is the election uh, we are we are paying uh, our money for uh, electing our representative for the the coming elections uh, we know I mean, considering the past experience, uh, there are some peak uh, candidate, those who are supporting uh, the the main parties. Maybe some of them are uh, uh, coming in the la uh, later part of the election, and we'll say, okay, we are supporting this man. This man is very good for the country, and he's doing well. 
and his policy is fine with us, so we are just supporting them. And, and the last elections also, and you can remember, I mean, all of us can remember, there, are, there were two candidates mm. who were similar to the, uh, the, the, uh, the real candidate's name, then spoiled the votes. So those kind of things can happen. There should be a provision, so some sort of prevention, this kind of people uh, contesting. But, uh, you know, I mean, uh, independent groups, without being uh, uh, parliamentarians, they can't contest. There are some uh, preventions, just coming and contest the election as an independent group. No, you can't. Uh, but there are uh, 70 political parties uh, existing, and any of these people can hire a, uh, this political party, and uh, they will use it. And there will be a lot of advantage for this uh, candidate also. They will get a huge publicity, and sometimes they will get the money. We know that some, some candidate sta already started the campaigning and uh, collecting uh, money from inside the country and outside the country. So there are a lot of advantage if you become a candidate. But we know in the past, there, are, there were so many candidates the, uh, then again, I, I need to tell you, I mean, and tell the public, there are some candidates, they know that they are losing, but they, whatever they believe, uh, they uh, uh, work for them. Mm -hmm. There are some candidates in the leftist parties, but there are more than 50% 50, 50 of the candidates, if you consider the past elections, they just come forward for supporting uh, some political party or uh, take some benefit advantage for themselves. Indeed, uh, we have a lot more to discuss. Uh, we want to talk about uh, certain factions like the youth, uh, the northern vote and how exactly this is going to play out. Uh, we'll get to all of that right after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back everyone to the program. We are here tonight with uh, Mr. Rohana Hetiarachi, who is the Executive Director of People's uh, Action for a Free and Fair Election, PAFRIL, and also Gehan uh, uh, Gunathilaka, who is the Research Director of Verite Research. We're discussing about the election and how exactly the votes will be playing out in this presidential election. I'm going to turn to you, uh, Gehan, and ask you, uh, we have the youth vote, we have the northern vote, we have a certain block vote. Uh, in your opinion, who do you think uh, would be the most decisive uh, group in this particular presidential election? So, I think traditionally we have uh, voters voting in Sri Lanka along three lines, right? We have voters who are interested in voting because of a particular political party, so they feel an affiliation to the party and they, they vote on that basis. Some voters may vote because of certain policy positions. Say, for example, a particular candidate wants to abolish the executive president presidency and the voter votes because they believe in that policy position. Or it could be something else. In the past, we had uh, so many people voting in the 50s for uh, SWRD Bandaranaika's party because he, they believed in the policy changes uh, that uh, that particular candidate uh, and the government that he promised uh, advanced. But then you also have voters who vote according to personality. So you have uh, party, uh, then you have policy, and you have personality. And in the recent past, you've seen an entire party actually established around personality. And that's the emergence of the Sri Lanka Pudujana Pegum. Mm. And that's in a sense unprecedented. Because in the past, we've always associated parties, uh, parties with certain policy positions, and, and there's been a, a, a much more diverse group uh, in, in terms of the leadership. But this SLPP is really built around the brand and currency of Mahinda Rajapaksa. So uh, we are uh, approaching this election uh, in a sort of unprecedented state where one of the candidates, Gotabe Rajapaksa, will be heavily dependent on uh, building on that currency of uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa and the, uh, the entire imagery that mm -hmm. has been created around Mahinda Rajapaksa. But the big question is whether the new voters that have now 
join the electoral register, how they are going to see this and whether they are voters that see themselves as affiliated to a particular party position, do they care about policies or are they attracted to this personality politics? It is very difficult to say. Um, I think some indication you get from the results of the local authorities' elections. Five million voters voted for SLPP, which was a new brand political new party. party, brand new political party. Again, we could interpret that as a protest vote because still at the local authority level, there's not so much power. Uh, it could be a, a, a testing ground to see what happens. Um, but really, five million votes for a brand new political party is significant. Uh, so we can expect some of these new voters to be driven by personality politics. The number of voters is another question. Now if you compare, and I think Rohana will be able to uh, verify this, if you compare the electoral register in 2000, end of 2014 mm -hmm. to now, there's been about a million new uh, voters, mm -hmm. right? The, the numbers vary slightly, but I would say some, somewhere between 900,000 and a million new voters. Uh, we don't know what really drives these voters, and I think they're up for grabs, because the traditional party politics and the traditional policy politics may not resonate with these voters. These voters may still be attracted to uh, personality. Uh, in that sense, Gotabe Rajapaksa's opponent will also have to contend uh, and be, with, be someone who can build an imagery around his personality. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is going to be the big question, whether the uh, the UMP is going to be able to produce a candidate of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, Rohana, um, if I turn to you and ask you about the um, Northern vote, uh, in, in 2005, we actually saw the Northern vote being the decisive factor. It actually swayed the election to uh, President uh, uh, Mahindra Rajpaksa. Um, in 2012, not so much. Uh, back again in 2015, uh, still not so much, but there was a sizable um, uh, support from the North to uh, President uh, Maitre Palasir Zenevia. We saw in the North uh, him uh, winning in huge margins. So in this election, how do you see that? Because we see that currently uh, the most important thing for most of the people in the South and in, in most parts of the country is security. And once again, we are back in that framework uh, before 2009. So how do you see the Northern Ward playing in this year's elections? Yeah, actually before that I would like to add one more point with uh, Gehan. Actually the protest vote also is, I mean in, in, if you look at the last, lo uh, the two elections, in 2015 presidential elections and the local elections, it is purely protest votes against the government. The 2015, the different government, the uh, local election with the different, with the present government. So it's it's purely, I'm not saying purely, but mostly the protest vote. So that also take place even the coming elections. But not only the northern uh, part. Actually, it will be a factor for these elections. The, uh, what is the the Muslim community, Muslim mm -hmm. leaders' decision on that? What is the Tamil leaders' uh, decision on the coming elections? And also the plantation sector. But I think uh, before 2015, most of these minor parties, um, I, I, don't, I don't like to say the minor parties, but in, in, in reality, uh, they did have some say, party leaders did have some say on their voters, but it's more split uh, within the parties. And there are so many, uh, the Tamil leaders came into the scene in the northern part. Even the, the chief minister mm. do have his own party now. And there are a couple of other the Tamil politicians. They also split. They don't have uh, one uh, arm, one person to handle the the people. But in 2015, as you mentioned, one directions, everybody abstained the vote. Uh, but now the situation is different. Even the Muslim 2005, you mean? 2005, yeah. Now the situation has different. So I think nobody can control over there as a one person. So. Uh, what we learn from the party leaders, the recent uh, discussions, even through uh, media, so they are waiting uh, the UNP candidate now, mm. and uh, they will look at the candidate and whether they can collaborate with him, whether they can gain something uh, from the the UNP candidate. Then only they will decide. And I don't know how far the uh, the international community also influences this uh, the elections. 
and some of the countries are really interesting in the country. So there are so many other factors we'll uh, uh, consider but by the parties. But in your opinion, uh, who do you think the North might be, uh, you know, more, more than the person, what kind of areas would they be interested in? Is it is it still security or is it still, you know, a breaking away and having their own uh, own uh, homeland? Or what, what would be the decisive factor in, in your opinion? I think the security is important for everyone. The northern people as well as the southern people also. The security is uh, the one of the key concerns, especially after the uh, East attack. Mm -hmm. But uh, the security, the national security is only one component uh, has to uh, uh, consider by the, uh, the either leader or uh, even uh, the people of the country. There are so many other factors. But I think northern people, uh, they are demanding over the years the, 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 uh, the dissolve the power. So that is why we brought up this uh, 13th Amendment and the, the Provincial Council system. So they will consider the, when they decide which party or which candidate they are going to support, uh, whether they will, uh, the, 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 the candidate or a leader, whether they will fulfill their uh, demand, their request. So whatever the, uh, the, the candidate who will get the advantage, then they will support that candidate. So I think it is too early to say mm -hmm. uh, which candidate, because the voters, in the, especially the, uh, the Tamil and Muslim community, I mean, if you look at the previous uh, uh, government, whoever come into power, except the TNA, the rest of the political party, uh, become a ministerial postfolio. <laughs> so they, 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 whoever coming, so they get advantage. So in these elections also, that, I think that is why they have not decided yet. They will see the, the both candidate and they will try to negotiate with the both candidate. Uh, and uh, they will see the, the, the best person for them. Indeed. Uh, Gihan, um, as the campaign starts going on from now onwards, we see uh, Gautabe Rajpaksa already started, we see Andhra Kumar Dusanaike going on, and we see in the United National Party, Sajid Premadasa, despite the fact that he's not yet been declared, is still doing his campaigning and all that. But in a scenario which we've been talking about uh, so far is the fact that no one can get a majority. It looks like no one can get a majority. In a scenario like that, it seems that if it goes for the second and the third preferential vote, it means that the main two candidates may have to have some kind of a partnership with the third and the fourth person in order to make sure that they their supporters would actually support them in order to get through the threshold of 50% and one vote. So what kind of a strategy should these people be uh, looking at when, when they proceed with their campaigning? It's a, it's a difficult strategy because uh, even indicating that uh, we may not get the first preference but please give us the second mm -hmm. preference is a weak campaign uh, sort of uh, strategy. It, 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 the, the optics of it mm -hmm. is, is not very uh, uh, convincing. Uh, also getting another candidate to say give me the first preference but give so and so the second preference also dilutes that person's candidate candidacy. Uh, for example, I can't see Anul Kumar Galisa Naika effectively going on uh, election platforms and saying vote for me but give a second preference to so and so mm -hmm. uh, that's going to dilute his his brand uh, so it's going to be a very tricky uh, campaign to run and I think actually it's only the minority vote that you can actually do that uh, because minority votes where there is no clear-cut candidate from those communities that sort of campaign can be run you can say give a protest vote to so and so but a, a pragmatic vote to another person and in that sense the mainstream candidates may look to try and create partnerships uh, with minority voting blocs uh, because that that In sort publicly of publicly or I think you will have public uh, sort of assertions. For example, if the the UMP com candidate comes forward, you are going to have to see, or you will. It's likely that you'll see that candidate uh, making overtures towards minorities. Uh, we do see that sort of rhetoric uh, even in Gotabe Rajapaksa's mm -hmm. candidacy and his campaign, where he he likes to place some imagery around him dealing with, say, the Muslim community. Uh, so that's 
that's part of the, the rhetoric, but I think they will have to make it more decisive because if uh, the second preferential votes are not, second preference votes are not cast in their favor, uh, that could be quite uh, a decisive blow in the final count. Now, in from the minority's perspective, I think just to add to what uh, Rohan has said, uh, I think we are seeing a situation where there is not much optimism and a lot of cynicism. And here you may see minority voters voting not for the candidate they like the most, but mm -hmm. the candidate that they dislike the least. Uh, and mm -hmm. really, uh, exactly. that's the sort of uh, uh, motivation you're going to see in the North and East and amongst my minorities uh, in the rest of the country. Indeed, um, we have to do, talk more about those minority votes. But before that, let's take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. You're watching Get Real. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone, to the program tonight. We are uh, here with uh, Rohana Hetiarachi, the executive director of uh, PAFRAL, and also Gihan Gunathilaka from uh, Verite Research. Uh, I'm going to ask you about one of the minority groups uh, which have been uh, in the forefront during the past three, four months, which is the Muslim um, community. Seems like they had certain camps prior to the Easter attacks. They were very much into either uh, the United National Party or the SLFP or the SLPP, and they've been supporting. But right now, what the events that unfolded from uh, April 21st has actually pushed them to, to literally come up with their own way of working. We even heard uh, that there would be a candidacy of one of the Eastern governors who, who say that he's ready to uh, contest the presidential election. What is your take, Rohan, uh, uh, with regard to the Muslim uh, minority right now? Um, will they be the decisive vote in this year's presidential election like uh, it was for the Tamils a uh, few years back? Of course, the, because Muslim community also uh, do have a sizable uh, uh, number of voters. So whatever their leaders' decisions, as I mentioned earlier also, there's a one, not a, such a one leader, but they have divided into various group. But in case if they come up with uh, one Muslim candidate, mostly because they are they are, they are very, uh, uh, I mean, the group uh, very working very uh, closely each other. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the East, after the East attack, how they work uh, as a community. So most, most of the people, Muslim people, may vote uh, for the Muslim candidate. But as uh, Gehan correctly mentioned, they have second preference because they know that at the end of the day, their candidate can't, cannot win. Uh, cannot win. And their can, campaign, they, strategically, they will try to show the, the public and the country their strength, uh, vote for their candidate. And the second preference, probably they will deal with, they will negotiate with one of these, the main candidate, either SLPP or a mm -hmm. UNP. Uh, and they will go for a second and third preference because this is an opportunity for them. They can show the public, they can show the country, this is our strength. And at the same time, they will try to deal with the, uh, the main candidate, uh, the coming election. I think, I, 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 we, we can't assume, uh, but uh, according to the percent, uh, the political uh, scenario, so we can guess that can happen uh, about the Muslim community. Gehan, uh, what are you learning uh, with regard to uh, the trends that is coming out after the April uh, 21st uh, Easter attacks? Um, seems like m most of the Muslim uh, community in Sri Lanka is more concerned about their security and, and uh, more concerned about the fact that, you know, how they could conduct their way of life going further. And they seems to be looking towards a candidate who can provide that. Uh, what are you learning? So we could go back to the 2014, uh, the lead up to the 2015 election. What happened in 2014, mid 2014, we had those attacks in Alutgama. Uh, and then there was a question as to whether what happened in Alutgama would influence the outcome of mm. the election. And I think to some extent it did. Uh, the, the fact that the government was unable to really 
prevent those attacks and also bring some perpetrators to justice would have cost them uh, the trust and the confidence of some Muslim voters. And if you look at the statistics, you will see that in some uh, Muslim majority areas, there was very clear uh, uh, preference for uh, Maitri Pala Sirisena over Mahinda Rajapaksa in that 2015 election. So I think any candidate will be aware of this history that uh, the inability to deal with violence and insecurity will drive a community to vote against you. Now, incidentally, since the new government came into power, we've had serious attacks in Gintota in 2017, we've had Digana Teldenia in 2018, mm. and then again Kurunagal and Gampa recently in May 2019, where the Muslim community was on the receiving end of mob violence. Now that would be a very significant factor for any Muslim voter. Which candidate can really provide a stable, secure environment for me? And your question is absolutely right. Now I don't still think that a Muslim candidate is necessarily yeah, going to be, be that viable serious. candidate. And I think uh, that we have to wait and see whether this is a serious bid to run for the presidency or whether this is just rhetoric. I still think uh, the Muslim community is going to have to uh, ultimately decide between uh, one of the two mainstream candidates or the third candidate. And, and putting forward their own candidate may not be uh, a viable sort of approach to this. Particularly given the fact that there is this, this sort of understanding or allegation, which I think is not a correct allegation, but it's still there, uh, that the Muslim community is insular. So they, they don't, I, I think it would be a mistake to, to signal that insularity by having an ethnic candidate. Uh, it, it is far more tactically uh, appropriate to look for a candidate within the range of candidates that are coming forward, not necessarily on ethnic lines. I'm not saying that candidates don't signal their yeah. ethnicity. Of course, uh, a candidate will, will play on his singular Buddhist identity or, or whatever identity. But I, I don't see this as a serious uh, bid by a Muslim candidate. I, I think we're still going to have the Muslim voters picking between mainstream candidates. And also, I think we should not encourage any political party to bring in any ethnic uh, or religion sort of kind of candidate. The candidate, whoever lead the country, he or she should come up with the policies, not, not the ethnicity line or... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, indeed. Yeah. Uh, shifting gears here, um, this is actually a very broad subject. Um, we wouldn't be able to discuss uh, extensively on this, but actually we are in a digital age. This presidential e election is going to be fought against fake news. This is, we see on a daily basis on, on, on social media that this is going to happen. As a voter, uh, who, who in the public, uh, when they're going through and in, ensuring that they get correct information, what do you think, what kind of a, 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 a st action or a, what kind of steps should they be taking, make sure that they get credible information and this time fighting fake news uh, in a presidential election like this? Uh, yeah, I mean, even if you look at the, uh, the, the recent uh, experience with the Easter attack, how the, the social media react on it. There are a lot of fake news and mislead the people. So it can happen in the coming elections because after 2015, even 2015 elections, we have observed, we have noticed that how the social media influenced the, the elections. Uh, the next presidential elections, it will be a uh, yeah. little bigger. Uh, so uh, the voters, are unfortunately, there is no uh, one source to get the, the clear-cut information. Only source is uh, the, the relevant information which they can obtain from the election commission. But unfortunately, uh, the elections commission also do have their limitations because some countries, but for example, uh, Taiwan, I don't know whether the, the world has recognized them as a country. But uh, in their elections, they are sending information uh, to the uh, voters about their candidate, all the basic information, their educations and other things. But uh, the other information, even that information, there's no system in Sri Lanka. Actually, we are appealing to the Elections Commission, but there's no such a law, but even without a law, Election Commission. I heard that uh, the Election Commission is going to take some action with regard to social media this time. Yeah, about. actually, we as an observer, uh, the two weeks back, we had a discussions with the Election Commission. 
and uh, we were discussed lengthily and even uh, we have discussed with the Facebook group. Now we are setting up uh, some uh, monitoring groups. Uh, I think PEFL and CME, we both we, we have discussed. Even today we have discussed this matter. And through the Elections Commissioner's channel, we are going to monitor that and we are going to inform the Facebook people. But that is only on the Facebook. I mean, social media is mm, uh, beyond the vast, beyond the, the Facebook. But there is no clear-cut mechanisms to control or monitor. And it's really expensive. And, and I'm personally, I'm not the favor to control the social media. We should allow the, uh, but uh, the unfortunately, uh, especially the the young groups, they are they have, they wanted to become a hero mm -hmm. in social media, right. and they are not really thinking about the country. I'm not saying the the entire social media groups, but we have realized them political party also. Yes, purposely. They are creating uh, fake news, misinformation. The party leaders need to take a responsibility and they need to, uh, uh, if they are serious about their country or their mm -hmm. people in the country, they should control in certain extent. Indeed, uh, Gehan, um, even very recently, soon after the SLPP's uh, youth convention, uh, there was a post which went out uh, uh, on social media. It was one of our cameramen, a Derna cameraman, uh, who actually got injured a few years back uh, from, a, from a riot. Uh, and his picture was put uh, where he was bleeding and the caption said apparently, you know, the youth wing uh, was attacking, which was completely fake. And even we had to go uh, on the air and, and, and uh, misspell that. So. Um, you seem to be that technology, a lot of organizations, even parties are investing on fake news, That's right. pushing this propaganda out. So how exactly do you think we can, and we saw the same thing happening in the US presidential election as That's well, right. where Russians, Russian interference and whatnot. So how, how can we make sure that, you know, we, we don't become a victim of that? Yeah, well, this is an absolutely important question and I'm glad you, you raise it. I mean, even Vegete, we've been looking at this whole issue of um, how do we combat disinformation? Because it's such a serious problem and in during elections you see a height, mm -hmm. heightening of disinformation because there's so much at stake. Uh, and I agree with Rohana that this is really getting disseminated on, in the online spaces and social media is a, is a real source of concern. Uh, but I want to make a slightly different point as well because I think a lot of uh, disinformation also originates from mainstream sources. Mm -hmm. Now a good example is this whole fiasco about Dr. Shafi. Where did that first originate? It originated on the front page of a mainstream newspaper. Exactly. So this is not just a problem about social media because some of the actual disinformation is originating from mainstream media sources and then it transfers into the social media spaces. So I think there is a important accountability that needs to be advanced across the board. And as much as I, I am I'm nervous about sort of making this point, it is an important point because I think as much as we point the finger at social media platforms, which I think we have to do, we also have to look into how mainstream news channels, mainstream news, uh, news institutions, uh, media institutions uh, are uh, conveying information in an inaccurate manner and creating impressions that may not be actually accurate. Uh, now, uh, one, one initiative that I think um, you asked the question, what are the solutions, is to act. One initiative that Vegete tried to champion is to do these fact checks. Mm. Now, politicians come out. That we make. see on, uh, on our d daily basis. On if daily, you see a yeah, uh, yeah. debate uh, in the That's US right. channels, we see that. We they see that. That's one way of combating because really politicians have to be held accountable for what they say. If they come and say something and it's uh, disseminated in the mainstream media and then it translates and transfers to the social media channels, we have to have some system by which we take that statement and assess its accuracy. And if we can build partnerships with mainstream media to actually give some uh, coverage to the fact that this is either a mm -hmm. true statement, so it's not only our false statement, sometimes the true statement also needs yeah. to get coverage. If it's a false statement, this is why it is false, and then drive that answerability where people don't feel that comfort to go and say whatever they like because someone is watching. 
And I think the mainstream media uh, channels and the institutions have a really important role to play there. Uh, not only in conveying information, but also holding these politicians to account. Because right now there's impunity. Right mm -hmm. now you can say whatever you like and get away with it. So doing this fact-checking, I think, is, is absolutely crucial. Indeed, uh, gentlemen, uh, we have to leave it at that. Seems like uh, exciting times uh, ahead. Let's see how this uh, election is going to play out. I want to thank uh, uh, Gehan Gunathilaka, who is the research director at Wayshay Research, and also uh, Rohan Hetiarachi, executive director of uh, People's Action for Free and Fair Election. It's going to be a busy time for you as well. Well, uh, thank you for joining me tonight. I'll be back on the other side with my closing arguments. Stay tuned. In my closing argument this evening, let's get rid of the 225. Let's change the system. Don't want any candidate. I will vote to protest. Very radicalized ideas that could portray the sentiments of how some of you might be thinking. It is utter rubbish. This is not the time to get rid of the 225. I mean, after we do, who's going to govern the country? Of course, we can be very prudent when selecting candidates, when we are sending them through the parliament. But we need a parliament to function as a nation. Don't like any of the candidates that's running for the presidential election, and you want to cast your vote as a protest vote. What good would that do to this country? Ask yourself, what good will it do to your future? We did this exercise back in 2015 and see the absolute mess we are in. The country's economy is in shambles, despite what the UNP says on election platforms. The head of state is literally running by himself, and his actions are blocked by members of the current government. We even saw, at a time when our leaders should unite after the April Easter attacks, they themselves were drifting further apart and started blaming each other. This is the result of the so-called January 8th revolution. It's not a revolution, let's be honest. It's a miserable action taken by duped citizens. So we have got another chance this time around. There's a candidate who has a vision for this country. Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa says that he wants to develop this nation through 21st century solutions to problems at hand. And then there is the possible UNP candidate, Minister Sajit Premadasa, who's providing you with promises of giving a better country through incentives. Also, the other possible candidate from the UNP, Prime Minister Rani Wickremesinghe, is now harping on the very little they did and saying he wants more time to do more. The third possible option, Mr. Andhra Kumar Zisanagitu, is giving uh, certain policy solutions that he thinks would help this country. After that, are their intentions nefarious? That's the question you need to ask. Well, learn, find out, educate yourself, judge them, and then come to a conclusion as to who is the best, and do your duty by your country, and cast your vote. Cast your vote. That is of paramount importance if you are to get out of this mess we are in. We need a stable leader with a credible leadership, and you need to make your decision right by the country. Don't be fooled by all these campaigns running around on social media saying that we shouldn't care, we, shouldn't get, we should get rid of whoever it is there, and we should not participate out of protest. Those campaigns are geared to keep our country down in the gutter. I want to leave you this evening with a quote from Keith Ellison, who was the Attorney General for the U.S. state of Minnesota. He said, not voting is not a protest, it is a surrender. Let's not surrender our country. From all of us here at Other Than a 24 and the Get Real team, thank you very much for watching. I'm Mahish Johnny. I'll see you next week. Good night.